in this module, we'll, we'll dive into a particular problem that you have when you design methods that are based on information contained in oscillatory processes in BCIs. And that problem is what we call the spatial filter problem. The problem is as follows. It's actually quite interesting. Um, the problem is that there is somewhere in your analysis pipeline, somewhere in your data flow, there's a nonlinear operation. Somewhere between raw data on your channels and the output of the BCI. And that nonlinear operation happens to be applied not to channel signals, but is sort of a source nonlinearity. And that is for a particular reason. That is, um, if you were to use an entirely linear method, uh, you would basically be in the ERP business, event-related potentials, which find some, um, if you say this is an oscillation, you know, it is maybe some kind of a high-frequency wiggle or so. Um, and you're trying to linearly map this onto the output. But the problem with high frequency oscillations is that obviously the phase shift might be entirely random. So for different trials, the phase of this oscillation can be anything. And so well, if you average this signal, you get basically a flat line out. Uh, to be able to use these ob observations, you have to somehow uh, you know, basically integrate over all possible shifts. And or pool in a sense, and that's in oscillatory processes usually done uh, by calculating the magnitude of something, um, complex magnitude actually. So here's a little very simplified um, three-step mapping from raw channel data, which is x here. It's a matrix of number of channels points, number of time points. We take the x, we multiply it by a spatial filter w. And so we get kind of an approximation of some spatially filtered. We call it, say, source time courses. So say this is a matrix that maps onto three sources, estimates the time courses for three sources. Uh, we would get a three by, say, a thousand time points matrix here for one trial. OK. And now we want to get to the spectrum. So we take S. We say do the Fourier transform. That's a linear operation. But then we take the absolute value to get the, you know, the magnitude of that, that oscillation, the power. Um, and that's this part. It gives us f, which is now the spectral, um, you know, uh, the, the spectral um, characteristics. And uh, then we map that onto the output with some kind of a linear mapping, say. So for example, let's, uh, if we had one channel, this would be a vector. And this could be an inner product between this vector and a weight vector, like an LDA, linear discriminant analysis, at a bias. This is exactly the same function of form that we had for ERPs, um, and get our, get our output. So um, the, tr the important thing is that this operation is not applied to the channel data, but it's applied to the source data. And the reason why it needs to be that way is if you calculated the, the magnitude already on the channels and threw away the phase information, you couldn't um, then map, uh, basically, then map um, and reconstruct the source um, spectral properties anymore. Because you've basically, the source time courses are linearly dependent on the channel data. There's a linear step first, then comes a nonlinearity, and then comes, say, a classifier. So if you throw the information away before you even get to the sources, there's no way a classifier can fix that or anything else. And so for this reason, you basically need at least two linear maps, the spatial filter and then the classifier at the end. And if we plot this kind of as a graphical model, you say, I have multiple channels, my source time courses, and between them, there is some relationship. It's the W, linear map. So this source channel, uh, in a sense, depends on, on everything with some weights. And this one is linear mapping expressed by this matrix. We do our frequency transform here, and then we get the frequency representation as power. And then at the end, we have our, um, our linear classifier, say, which maps it onto a one-dimensional value, a scalar. That could be, say, minus 1 or plus 1. So a single try is set, sent through this pipeline, linear map, linear map, nonlinear, and we're done. And so now, how do we train these? How do we calculate the right parameters? which we don't know in advance because you know, it's a new person. We've never seen data from this person and so on. If we could get up to this stage where we have features, basically, we could do the same 
as in previous lectures, we just train a classifier on the features and calculate this parameter, you know, the, the linear weights of the classifier, or if you had a nonlinear classifier, nonlinear weights. That would be easy. We have an algorithm for this. But what we don't have an algorithm for is how to calculate the W. So um, LDA cannot optimize this because there's some custom stuff in between. And so there's different ways to get that W. And one way to learn it is to just not learn it and assume in advance that we just use some very simple constructed spatial filters. So for example, we could say, we take a channel and subtract all the others, uh, the average of that. That would be common average reference. We could say we're done. You know, we have the W. It's just you know, a spatial filter. It looks like this. We take a channel, subtract the others. Um, and we just optimize the theta. But you will find that it just doesn't work particularly well. It's not adapted to the person. It doesn't address what the cortex is folded of the person underneath and so on, right? There's a various other methods. You can use bipolar der derivations. People have done this in the 80s, for example. Take this channel minus that channel. And there is a surface Laplacian, which pro produced the cutoff plots at the beginning of this lecture, which is a channel minus this, the neighboring ones. So all of these are not too bad, but none of them works really well. And in many cases, you just have no guarantee whether it actually works. You can be really unlucky such as if this is a dipolar projection underneath, it might project positively here and negatively there, the source, and zero here. So it's just nothing that shows up in your um, output. So the second option to get the W is to actually do some calculation. And that is sort of um, if you take some value for W and theta, um, you can basically, and if you know the data and the labels, you know, some example data or some example labels, you can basically optimize these two using gradient descent or so. Uh, this is a multi-layer thing. It's similar to a neural network. You can basically use back propagation to update this. The only problem is that um, just in, in, as in neural networks, uh, if you do gradient descent, there's probably many local minima in here if, in this sort of parameter space. And so y you will improve things if you had an update rule for this to improve W incrementally or so. But you have absolutely no guarantee that it's optimal or anything like that. So, but you can do it. There's another one, which is, uh, well, we're not trying to even look at the labels. We are, we're completely ignoring task parameters and whatever. We're just looking at the raw data. And we're just trying to learn the W from the raw data. And that would be unsupervised learning. We're not looking at labels. And so how might that work? So the idea is, well, maybe we can capture just the dominant structure in our data and find the dominant sources and find spatial filters to extract these dominant sources. Well, and that's what independent component analysis does, what dictionary learning does, sparse coding, principal component analysis. So there are tons of methods that you can apply just given some raw EEG to learn some good components that hopefully um, also pick up the signal that you're really interested in. The only trouble is that um, there's no guarantee <laughs> that these components contain what you were actually looking for. It might be some rather subtle process. Although in the case of idle oscillations, we luckily know that, well, idle oscillations are rather strong um, EEG phenomena. and so you can expect that there is, for example, independent components showing up which actually ex exhibit and, and identify, um, you know, specifically idle oscillations. But there's other processes that might be much more subtle where you have much less guarantee that you're getting good things. And there's another option that is um, to do some kind of a mixture of that. You can, that's called semi-supervised learning, for example. You could do, for example, first an ICA to calculate this and then sort of in some way fine tune the component ve weight vectors using a supervised criterion. So you're about right, and then you tune it a bit so that it hopefully picks up what you were looking for. And there's actually flavors of ICA that are called supervised ICA, where you can have some kind of an information using some label information over here to get these parameters optimized better. You know. So um, there's stuff like that. In fact, uh, you know, the restricted Boltzmann machines of Hinton et al 
uh, are designed in a similar way. You know, you do unsupervised pre-training. You can actually use the exact same algorithm for this data and then fine tune it using labor information. Again, you have the problem that you don't know whether your result is actually under any meaningful assumption somehow optimal or something like that. And also, there's only so much you, know, you can do with fine tuning. So there's yet another way. And that is, you see, it's, it's a really big problem, right? There's yet another way. And this is instead of trying to calculate it, measure it. So um, if we know what we're looking for, say, Say we think that the action happens here from an fMRI scan or so. Um, if we get an, a scan of the you know, cortical folds and all that of the person, and if we have an electromagnetic model, we could essentially calculate a good spatial filter that picks up stuff that happens here or that happens on a particular part of the surface. And one methodology for this is beamforming. So there's tools for that. FieldDrip, for example, has it. And Actually, BCI Lab will include this relatively soon too, but we currently don't have it in here, in here because these measurements are rather expensive to to get. You know, EEG cap is easily slapped on one five minutes or so, but getting someone into an MR scanner and measuring all that and being you know getting it right that's a whole other story. So um, none of that is really all that satisfying, and there is one more uh, approach. It's also not perfect, but it's the one that basically works best empirically in, brain in the brain-computer interface field. That is, make enough extra assumptions on the data so that our problem of deducing W becomes analytically solvable <laughs> or, uh, in, a, in some sense, uh, detractable. And the assumption that people make is the time series that we have, x or so, is jointly the oscillation in that the signal is jointly Gaussian distributed. Okay, so the source activations are Gaussian, and uh, after you've mapped them on the channels, it's basically even more Gaussian because you've mixed things up. So under that assumption, um, it turns out it can become tractable, and that will actually take us to the next uh, module in this lecture.